This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Speaker Series. My name is Cheryl Peach, and I'm a program scientist here at the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego. It's really a pleasure to have you all here this evening, um, and it's very much a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Jenny Hoffmeister. I promised her that I would keep this short, but I have three things that I would like to say about Jenny. First of all, I think that she exemplifies the excellence of the postdoctoral scholars that we attract here at Scripps. That is her position here. She actually comes here under um, the sponsorship of California Sea Grant. This is quite an honor. Not many people get these Sea Grant fellowships, and Jenny certainly deserves it. She's also a testament to our wonderful University of California system because she comes here after receiving a bachelor's degree in biology from UCLA and then a PhD in integrative biology from University of California, Berkeley. Just a phenomenal scholar and a wonderful addition to the Scripps scientific community. Second, she's an extraordinarily accomplished research diver. I know many of you here are familiar with the history of uh, diving here at Scripps and in particular our wonderful research dive program. And Jenny's an excellent addition to that and she's gonna, you're gonna get an opportunity to hear about her work, her research diving in this talk. Um, and then finally, um, and this is particularly important to me, she's one of a next generation of um, new young scientists who place a premium on science communication and outreach. So I've had the opportunity and the privilege to work with Jenny over the course of the summer on some of these outreach activities. And it's really heartening to me to see this generation of scientists, Jenny among them, coming along who really feel that it's their responsibility to bring um, to the public an understanding of their research and why they do it. So Jenny is actually um, giving a talk that I think has attracted a lot of you here. Um, it's about her work, her research work, and her dive work, and understanding the behavior of uh, the octopus and how that bears on uh, attempts to actually reintroduce an endangered species, the, um, the abalone. So please join me um, in welcoming Jenny for her talk titled The Hungry Octopus and the Endangered Abalone. Jenny, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Cheryl, for that wonderful introduction. I almost teared up a little bit, so I, I appreciate your kind words. And thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, as Cheryl mentioned, it's really important to me that I talk to the community about the kind of work that I'm doing, the kind of work that Scripps is doing, and the project that I'll be talking to you today about focuses on two players in a story. We have the octopus and we have the abalone. But first, let's set the scene. We are in the kelp forest rocky reef ecosystems off the coast of California. And these ecosystems occur throughout the entirety of California up into Oregon, Washington, and Canada, um, and into Alaska. And there's different species of kelp and algae that expand through the different parts of the range. In Southern California, we're most familiar with what you see pictured here. This is macrocystis, or the giant kelp. And it creates this beautiful and productive ecosystem. This is a video of one of the dives. This is from Catalina Island a few years ago. And it is one of, I think, the most beautiful places on this planet. People told me when I got scuba certified, oh, once you go to the coral reefs, you'll never want to go back to cold water kelp again. And I disagree. I think this is, I feel like a mermaid. There's no place else where you could actually feel like you're flying through a forest. And it's absolutely incredible. So first, the first character in our story is the protagonist, or the abalone. This particular, this is a photograph or an, an artist rendition of the white abalone, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that species in particular and why we care so much and why we're putting so much effort towards them. 
But we have a few abalone species in Southern California. For those of you who are a little bit older, you may not even know what an abalone is. The fishery was closed in Southern California in 1997. So I know I've talked to a lot of people who were in this area before then, my, my dad included, that they could see tons and tons of abalone everywhere. And it was a very common and um, ubiquitous you know, group of animals. And unfortunately, they're also delicious, which is their ultimate downfall. Uh, we do have an active recreational fishery still up in Northern California. Um, but in Southern California, we haven't had that fishery active again since 1997. But we have a few different abalone species present. We, so here's our Southern California ecosystem. We have the red abalone, the white abalone, the pinto abalone or threaded abalone. Oh, sorry, that's the pink abalone, sorry. The green abalone, and that's the pinto or threaded. And I know it, looking at these pictures, there's striking differences between all the different groups. So you could easily pick these out. No. Um, so what missing from the map is also the black abalone, which has a, a range that covers the entirety of Southern California as well. So as I mentioned, they are delicious. Um, and there was an active commercial fishery and recreational fishery throughout California. And this graph represents the tonnage that was taken of abalone through time. So on, I do have a little pointer here. So on the bottom axis here, you see year. And on the side axis, the y axis, you see tons. And you see this trend, and we've seen this trend a lot in looking at the history of our fisheries and looking at the history of the species we've taken and how we've progressed. We have this red abalone, we're taking a bunch, and then eh, their numbers kind of piddle out. OK, so we're going to switch over to this pink abalone. There's lots of them. We're going to take them. They're delicious, too. So eh, but then eventually they go down, too. And then we switch to a new species, and then black, and then white. And that trend we see all over the place. And it's called cereal depletion. So we see the cereal depletion of abalone, which is the main reason why we don't have an open and active fishery in Southern California anymore. So now what? We have this history. We've looked at how, what we've done and how we've maybe mismanaged this fishery. And we're moving now into an era where some of these species are endangered. So the white abalone, that artist rendition I showed you not too long ago, is was the first marine invertebrate to be listed as a federally endangered species. And that wasn't until 2001. So it wasn't until 2001 that we got concerned enough to put this animal on the endangered species list and really start trying to actively figure out, OK, how are we going to prevent this from happening? And since then, the black abalone has since been put on the endangered species list. And several of these species are listed as species of concern. So as a whole, all of our abalone we're worried about. We're worried. We want to make sure that these populations are able to sustain, them, sustain themselves and that they're not going to be subjected to uh, possible further declines in populations as we move forward in time. So the white abalone, as I mentioned, the first marine invertebrate to be listed as an endangered species, has recently been chosen as one of NOAA's, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration's species in the spotlight. Um, it's too bad that this talk wasn't in August, because August was white abalone month. But that's OK. So I, I declare September is also White Abalone Month. Um, and so there's been a lot of effort to, to understand more about the species and to help bring it back from the brink of extinction. And I will mention, too, of the, of the species identified in this campaign, in the Species in the Spotlight campaign, campaign this is the only invertebrate. So go abalone. <laughs> This is a time lapse of a white abalone off the coast of Southern California. A picture was taken every 10 minutes for 48 days. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. <laughs> so this type of work is really important for us because we need to understand, OK, if it's not going anywhere, how is it getting its food? What is it doing? How does, what does this matter for the populations? And we've done a lot of different, uh, different time lapse studies like this. And these abalone spend less than 10% out of the frame of the camera. So most of their life, th that, 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 this is it. This is what we see. But what it means is that if we're trying to understand or trying to manage the populations and trying to get the populations back up to where they need to be, they're not moving to each other. So we know that they have to be close enough together in order to find a mate and continue to, and reproduce and continue the population. But they're so far apart 
and they're not going together. So we determined not too long ago that this species will not survive. It will become extinct, extinct without human intervention. And that is where NOAA has come in with their species in the spotlight, and that is where I come in and helping that effort that's being done by a larger team throughout all of California. So why do abalone matter? I'm, there's a, I could give a whole other talk about this, but I'm just going to highlight three things that I think are incredibly important. One is they are uh, kelp forest architects. I described this to a, a student group I was working with a couple days ago, that it's all of these different animals in the kelp forest ecosystem, imagine they each had their chore. And if, I, if my job to do the dishes, as it usually is, and I just don't, or I disappear, I go to Hawaii for six months and don't do my chore, and no one else can do my chore, then the whole system shuts down. My, you know, there's no cooking that can happen, there's no, and then everybody starves and everything is the worst. So, these abalone have an important role in, in being kelp forest architects, in eating the algae that allow other algae to grow in, um, and competing with other invertebrates, and they have a very important role, and that role specifically also bleeds into the second point, which is biodiversity. This is also yet another talk I could, I could give about the importance of biodiversity, the number and different types of species and animals we have in our ecosystems, and how that helps ecosystems thrive and, and be robust against change. And for those of you who have been to the climate change exhibit and have turned on the TV once in the last few years, you will know that we have a lot of change that we're seeing happen, and we're concerned about it. So the more biodiverse an ecosystem is, the more robust it is to that change. And so when we see loss of species, loss of diversity, it's concerning. And finally, there's a huge cultural aspect to abalone fishing. So this is, this is me and my husband and my dad. My dad has been abalone fishing his entire life. He taught it to me. And I know a lot of people where that's a very important part for them, is not only to is not only to, to bring the species back from extinction, but also to hopefully open up a, a recreational fishery again and maintain this cultural identity that has been so important for a lot of California coastal communities. All right, so just briefly, what is, there's a lot being done, as I mentioned, I'm just part, I'm one little part of a huge team that's working towards this effort. One of the major efforts is the the, cult, the culturing of baby, of baby abalone. This is a little baby white abalone. It's so cute. Um, and in Bodega Marine Lab in Northern California, that's where the majority of this effort is happening. And they have been able to raise and, and thousands and thousands and thousands of little baby white abalone. They now have more white abalone in that lab in, um, in Bodega Bay than exist in the wild. We are also doing a lot to monitor adult populations. As you saw from that time lapse, they don't move very much, so we can take a GPS coordinate and go back the next year and get that abalone is still there. Looks like it's still pretty good. Um, so it helps for monitoring the populations. And then we are constantly doing new surveys, ROV surveys out on the Channel Islands to find new adults, to find uh, new habitat, which is my next point. We're trying to identify good white abalone habitat. So when we do put all those little babies that are up in Bodega out in the wild, what's going to be their best chance? Um, so we have to identify this good, this good habitat for them to live in. We also have education and outreach is a big part of NOAA's initiative. This is Kristen Acolino. She's leading the, um, the, the culturing project in Bodega Bay and raising all those little baby white abalone. So this is one of the adults um, and this is one of the couple, maybe about two year old baby. So they're pretty slow growing. It takes uh, about a decade for them to get this size. So it's a lot of work, a lot of effort that goes in to raising these adorable little snail things. <laughs> All right. And then finally, the aspect of the project that I am working on is once, now that we have all these little babies in the lab, the whole point is to stick them out in the wild. And then eventually they grow up to be reproductive adults. And the, our ultimate goal is that the population be able to sustain itself, sustain itself without us doing anything. So we tried this in January. We did not use the white abalone. We used a surrogate species. What you see pictured is a red abalone. It's also what is on exhibit here at the Birch Aquarium. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we were going to get it right with a non-endangered species before we did it with the very precious baby white abalone that we have. 
So we put about 3,000 out there. We monitored, we put little tags on all of them. We were so excited. And then we came back the next week and the octopus had eaten them all. I mean, there were some survivors, presumably, but the octopus was a huge, huge predator on the abalone, way more than we were expecting. And um, we realized we need to be paying attention to this predator. We need to be paying attention to what they're doing because our understanding of the octopus is going to be a huge influence on the success of this project. All right, so now we have the antagonist. Now that's from the abalone's perspective. From the octopus perspective, it's, it's, it's the hero. It's the hero of its story. And I have a history in octopus, studying octopus behavior and ecology, so I have a soft spot for the octopus. When we discovered all of the little abalone that had been eaten by the octopus, the abalone scientist in me was very sad, but the octopus scientist in me was very excited. So I have a <laughs> dueling personalities going on. But I'm gonna... Tell a few reasons why octopuses are the coolest and why it's been a challenge to understand their, um, understand their behavior and, under, and, and mitigate these effects of octopus predation on our abalone. So one, they got kind of weird, cool anatomy. They have three hearts, nine brains, the ability to regenerate, and only one hard part, which is their beak, which is their mouth, which is located on the underside of all of their arms. The nine brains is really what gets most people, and it gets me too. So they have one centralized brain, and then each arm has its own individual brain. So, wrap your head around that one. <laughs> um, and not only do they have, they have the ability to regenerate. So something bites off their arm and they can grow it right back. It takes a little while, but it's, pretty, it's a nifty skill that I'm sure many of us wish we could do. So here's a close-up of that beak, that mouth part, and it's, it really looks like a beak. It was named appropriately. Um, and so, it's, yeah, as I mentioned, it's located in the base of all of those arms underneath. Um, and they also have this radula, which is like a, it's a rasping tongue, and it's a, a characteristic that all mollusks have. And it's so they can essentially lick through shells that they might not be able to yank off the rock. It's just one more way that makes them a pretty effective predator. So here is a video. I did not take this. This is from a fishing boat. This is a giant Pacific octopus, the same species that's on display here at the aquarium. And as I mentioned, the only hard part is the beak. So any, sp any place that their beak can fit through, their whole body can fit through. So this animal is maybe about 70 or 80 pounds. And the beak is probably about the size of a, of a golf ball, maybe a tennis ball. So any hole that, that small, the entire animal will squeeze through. And you'll see in a sec this animal goes through what looks like an impossibly small hole. This makes it very challenging for aquarists to keep them in a tank. Um, <laughs> Many of you probably heard about the octopus that escaped in a New Zealand aquarium not too long ago. This is a very common thing. They always seem to be one step ahead. And they're naturally curious just by nature. And so if they get bored, they're, they're going to look. And wait, bloop. All right. So the next part, and a lot of people, this is what they think of too, is they're so smart. And they really kind of are. They have the amazing ability to learn and to problem solve. So a lot of people have seen videos of octopus opening jars from the outside. This research group or taught an octopus how to open up a jar from the inside. I don't think I can do that. <laughs> and you imagine each little sucker, they can control each sucker individually. And they have the strength and dexterity that you cannot even imagine. Ta-da! All right. And so, and then this natural curiosity, this ability to learn and problem solve gets in the way of my research, too. This, I was trying to do a behavioral trial with this octopus, and yeah. <laughs> if you, you can hear the sucker sounds. Yeah. So I think it liked my GoPro light. And I didn't, you know, I saw, I was off to the side and I just saw like an arm coming over the side. I'm like, oh, go back in. 
So it, it, yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. All right. Um, the other thing that they're really unmatched in the animal kingdom is their ability to camouflage. So this is a series of pictures taken by my PhD advisor, Roy Caldwell. This is the same octopus, and each photograph is 13 milliseconds apart. So it went from this to this to this to this. So it's not only color, it's the texture of their skin too, which is just mind boggling. Okay, this is one of my favorite videos of all time. When do you see the octopus? So the, the video in a sec will go in slow motion reverse. So you'll see exactly how the animal uh, changes from the all white and then go back into the, the algae looking rock stuff. And you can imagine this makes it pretty difficult for me as a researcher to find them, to study them. Um, I've gotten pretty good over the years, but I've definitely been looking at something that I thought was a rock and turned out to be an octopus. And not only do they have these types of pure color displays, but they also have behavioral displays too. This is a video that I took. Uh, it was an octopus that were released in, in a sandy um, habitat to see what types of behaviors that it um, took on. And this is called the flamboyant display. And it's looking like algae. It's not looking like an octopus. And you will also see animals who, uh, or octopuses in aquaria, that are kind of waving back and forth as if there was a current, and you ask the aquarist, is there, is there a current? And they say no. They are able to mimic algae, things in their environment to help them blend in, not only with that color and texture, but also behaviorally. And finally, they are amazing hunters. And this is where, you know, com where a lot of my work comes in, because I'm very interested in them as hunters. So watch closely. The octopus jumped out of the water to get a crab on land. They're sneaky and they're clever and they are capable of taking advantage of situations. And this is what the abalone are up against. So you can see the challenge in understanding what the octopus, how, how understanding what the octopus is doing is going to help us give these abalone the best chance at survival. And given all of these things, I'm really interested in understanding why are they going where they go, where do they go, what do they like, what do they not like, and how can we use that information to inform the abalone recovery while also learning a lot about octopus in the process. So I, the question I pose to myself is, can we outsmart the octopus? I feel like so far, no. I think they're smarter than I am. Um, but this is the California two-spot octopus, and it's noticeable by that bright blue spot right at the base of the head. Uh, it's a fairly common species here in Southern California. It's not usually the one you'll see in tide pools if you, if you ever go tide pooling. It's usually the red octopus that you'll see tide pooling. Um, and those guys are a little feistier. These guys are beautiful and quite nice. Um, so in science, we often focus on what don't we know and try to address those gaps in knowledge. So for octopuses specifically, we don't really know what habitat they like. What are they associating with? What are they choosing in the wild? And conversely, what don't they like? What, are they, what areas are they avoiding? Why are they avoiding them? And then how, when, why do they move? How, when do they, how do they make that decision to go from this area to this area when they stay in this area for longer than that other area? Keeping in mind all those amazing things that I talked about before about what make them incredible animals and incredible hunters. Trying to incorporate all that together. All right, so in order, now we're getting into the research that I'm doing to try to answer these questions. First, I catch them. And then I tag them. I essentially alien abduct them and I put a transmitter in their head and then I release them back in the wild and they tell other friends about it and their friends don't believe them. Um, so the tag itself is pretty small. It's, uh, it's, about a little, it's a little black cylinder 
And I have this set up where it's, it's glued to a plate and there's a securing plate. And this actually goes inside the animal. I have a little animation. So octopuses naturally have a cavity, have an opening in their head. So I don't have to do surgery. I don't have to cut or anything. I just kind of slip that transmitter in and I secure it in place like the back of an earring. It's very fast. Um, they don't like it, but it's over soon. Um, and when it's all said and done, it looks a little bit like something like that. So the tag itself is inside the animal. This is just what's on the outside. And that tag is releasing a coded sound, a coded ping every few, every few minutes. And that ping is going to talk to some equipment, which I will get to in a second. So once they are tagged, and I let them calm down from their ordeal for a little bit. I release them right back into the den they came from. So really, it, it's like they had a bad dream. Um, and then we track them. So out in, the, out in La Jolla, I have a series of receivers, which are represented by these kind of black blobby things. And those receivers are detecting the sounds that's being released from each coded tag inside my octopus. So as the octopus moves around, it's releasing, releasing that sound. It's picked up by, if it's picked up by at least three receivers, it's able to use triangulation, a fancy term that most of us have you know, heard before in, um, in various aspects of, of the media. And it uses that triangulation to calculate the location of the animal. Most people don't know GPS doesn't work underwater, <laughs> which really is not fair for me. So my terrestrial friends, they can put a little GPS thing on their squirrel, and their every you know every inter interval, the the GPS uh, the transmitter can record the exact location of that squirrel as it moves through its environment. This is a way to get around that lack of GPS underwater. So I know the position of all of my receivers, and given that known position, I can then get an idea of exactly where the octopus is, and where it's moving. And this, is, this, this, this position is being calculated several hundred times a day. So I'm getting really good resolution as far as where they're going, what habitats they're staying in, how long they're staying in. And in the wild, my receivers look a little something like this. Um, my name and phone number is on them, so in case your anchor accidentally drags one up, please call me. Um, and they're, they're, they are anchored by a cement block down there and a lovely float to keep them up. And this, this tip down here is what's recording that sound. And I have about 16 out there right now. And this study, unfortunately, is a bit of an anticlimactic because I have to wait nine months for any results. So it's all exciting. I tag the animal. We're ready to go. And then we wait. So maybe if I'll, I'll give a talk next year, and I'll actually have some data for you. But I can give you some idea of where they're moving based off of work I've done in Catalina using a similar technique. So each one of these little like lumpy circle things represents an area that was uh, traversed by the octopus over the course of about two weeks. The dark circles, the darker parts of each lump are the areas where they were most commonly, most often, about 95% of the time they were found in that area. Um, and, then the, and then the next one out is 65 and the next one out is 35. So, it's hard, you know, it's hard to understand the scale, but what if we're talking about an animal that is only one pound to two pounds? This, this animal in particular, Animal D, covered an area of over 10,000 square yards or 10,000 square meters. That's a lot of area for a relatively small animal and only over two weeks. So I cannot wait for my data in nine months to see how far they've gone and what they have done in that time. And I, in addition to this tracking, I try to ground truth a lot of the movement data that I get with surveys. I'm in the water a lot. I, I went scuba diving this morning, actually. So I'm doing a lot of surveys by laying out transect tapes, which are essentially big, long measuring tapes that allow scientists to quantify um, areas of the environment. And then I swim around and count things. It's pretty fun. And there's a few key pieces of information that I focus on that are relevant to the octopus and our understanding of how that octopus is moving. I look at some of their predators, the kelp bass or calico bass and the California sheephead. Some, so I count the octopus, I count their den competitors, the lobsters, and another important predator, the moray eel, which is, side note, probably my most feared animal. I don't know why. I'd rather see a great white shark over an eel any day of the week. But 
I don't know. All right. And then I also look at things on the benthos, things on the bottom, like their prey, have rocky types, you know, different types of rocks and the 3D complexity of that, and the different algae types as well, to see if all of this is, is affecting, again, their habitat that they like and what they don't like and why they're moving where they're moving and how are we going to put all of this together in the big picture to understand octopus and then use that information to help restore the abalone populations. If I could Dr. Doolittle the octopus, that's, that's what I want to do. But because that's not possible, science is honestly the next best thing. <laughs> science is letting me, through you know, quantifiable ways, Dr. Doolittle the octopus and learn what's going on in their head and why they're making the decisions that they are. Oops, so this is one of the very, very commonly what I see. Not, this is a, in California, not quite as colorful as the camouflage video that I showed you earlier, but you can still see their texture and their color, and they are so well matched in their environment. And he's very wary of me. And then he slides out of the way. So we had our, our protagonist. We had our antagonist, but I hope you guys think by the end of this talk that the octopus has got some pretty good characteristics too. And the ultimate goal isn't to get rid of the octopus. The ultimate goal is to help restore balance in this ecosystem that has been, that has been in balance for millennia. But we've altered it in some way. We've altered it by taking out the abalone. And in order to give the abalone its best shot at survival and remove it from the endangered species list, we have to know more about its main predator, the octopus. And in that process, we learn a lot about an incredible, incredible animal that is very unique in the evolution of life on this earth. And understanding how it all fits together in the ecosystem, which I think is the most beautiful place in the world. So as Cheryl mentioned, this work is funded by the California Sea Grant. Um, that's my website, and uh, funding and support also from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Thank you. The question is, what's happening with abalone withering disease? So for those who don't know, uh, abalone seem to have this, um, this viral infection that's inside them. And pretty much every animal in the wild seems to have it. And warm temperatures trigger the response. And, 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 it, and it essentially blocks their gut and allows them to not process the food that they're eating. And they essentially starve to death. Not necessarily because there's a lack of food, but because their body just cannot process that. And we are seeing that up and down the coast of California um, and into Washington and Oregon. And it's, one of, it's, a, it's a major concern especially in as we are raising these animals in the lab and we want to put them in the wild, it's going to be almost impossible for them not to, not to contract that. And a lot of them already have it anyway. Um, we have been seeing a different trend in Northern California this season. You know, the El Nino, many of you have heard probably about the blob and El Nino and these two different warm water events that, that's been affecting the California coast. Um, Northern California has been hit very, very hard by these two warm water events. And what it resulted in is a mass die-off of all of the kelp and all of the algae in that area. Those, th those algae do not like warm water. So we've seen a lot of very skinny, emaciated abalone. And we did some tests to see if the withering syndrome was what's causing that, because the symptoms look pretty much the same. Either way, they're starving to death, but the cause is slightly different. And we found no expression of the disease. And so we, we figured that from, in the northern populations at least, we that's, that was from starvation, from lack of algae, lack, lack of food. So it's a constant, we're, and there's a lot of work that's being done at the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Center, which is right up here, on understanding more about the genetics of that disease and the way it affects the populations. The question is, if they have brains at every arm and they can regenerate, are they regenerating those brains? Or, um, or what, what's happening if, if a limb is lost? So the brains themselves are located more at the base of the arm. Um, and so generally when an arm is lost, the, that base is still maintained. And it's not a true brain in the sense that we think of, but it's a, it's a cluster of ganglion that can perform basic functions without ever talking to the main brain. It's kind of, it's kind of like a reflex. You hit your knee and, you're, and, you're, and your leg jerks up and 
your brain never told your knee to do that. The knee just did it on its own. So you take that, but it, expand it by like a million. Um, because the octopus arms, without ever talking to the main brain, can search for food, identify food. They have taste buds surrounding every single sucker on their arm. So they, 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 they hunt by tasting, by touch. And so without even talking to that main brain, each arm can determine, yes, food, no food, bring food to mouth, eat food, move, ow, move. So it's actually very efficient when you think of it nervous system wise, because the, then the main brain can deal with other stuff like crazy complex camouflage and not worry itself with the more simple things. So the question is when they're getting out of the jar, is it the little brains or the big, big brain that's dealing with that? And it is a combination of all the brains coming together to take over the world. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's for, so for a complex behavior like that, it's the whole, every, everything working together. So the question is about their vision. How sophisticated is their vision? And their vision is absolutely incredible, um, but it's also a little funky. So structure-wise, it's a really neat example of convergent evolution. Two different groups and types of animals that evolved the same, almost the same structure, but in, in different trajectories within the tree of life. So they have a lens, eye very similar to ours. The structure is very similar to ours, um, but they, actually did it a little better in that we have that blind spot where our optic nerve goes in. Um, they don't have that. And so, but they also have something a little bit funky in that we don't think they see color, which is amazing to look at some of the camouflage videos I showed you and think that that animal isn't seeing color. But new research, and this is really cutting edge, we're still just understanding this. And the reason why we think they don't see color is we don't find any of those, color, those colored pigments. So in our eyes, we have three different pigments, pigments that are able to uh, perceive color, red, green, and blue. And that combination allows us to see the visual world that we do. But an octopus doesn't have those pigments. But new cutting edge research, and this is so exciting, suggests that maybe the skin itself is detecting color. This is craziness. <laughs> so again, very recent research, there's a lot of really phenomenal scientists who are working on understanding this. And, and, and it, the more we learn about octopus, the more we realize they are representing a very unique part of the tree of life. And they are worth understanding. So the question is, is there a connection between some of those predators of octopus that are very heavily fished um, by us, the California sheephead and the kelp bass, um, and this effect of octopus predation on abalone? And the answer to that question is, we don't know yet. Um, that's a phenomenal hypothesis, and it's one that I've been testing. Um, and I've done some work on Catalina. And I, the, one of the big challenges with octopus is they're, they're really variable. So between from year to year, and sometimes even seems like from day to day, I think there's just so much in their head going into the decisions that they make. Um, I need to live for about 100 years and also go back in time I, to see a, a you know, long-term data set and how those fluctuations and predators and octopus have really all linked together. Um, my hypothesis is that they are definitely connected somehow, but the exact details of that, I'm not quite sure. So the question is, how long do we predict that the white abalone will survive, will survive if humans don't intervene? Um, right now, it's a matter of the adults that are currently in the wild dying. We've been, so the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and NOAA has been monitoring natural recruitment of baby white abalone um, since they were placed on the endangered species list in 2001, and a lot of scientists before that. Um, Scripps actually has a long history of, of abalone, and in the mid-90s before the fishery was closed, Scripps scientists were saying, hey, we need to do something about this. These, these populations are declining. <laughs> Um, so, so far we have no evidence that the abalone, that the white abalone specifically are recruiting and making babies on their own. And as you saw, they don't, they don't go anywhere. So they're just too distant. There's too few of them. They're too far apart. So if we don't do anything, the white abalone will be extinct probably in less than a decade. And that will just be waiting for the current adults to die at whatever, uh, we think they can live about 30 years. So whatever their natural lifespan is. 
So the question is, is there a minimum size, is there like a size cutoff from when abalone are vulnerable to octopus predation? Um, and the answer is yes, especially in Southern California. So down here we don't have the giant Pacific octopus. It's a little too warm for them. They really kind of end around the Monterey, you know, San Luis Obispo area. Um, and those big guys, those are big octopus. They can get to be 150 pounds and they will eat any size abalone, no problem. The octopus that we have here in Southern California never get more than about two or three pounds. So there is a size that the abalone get to where they are no longer vulnerable to octopus predation. The problem is, is that it takes a long time. You know, to, for an animal to get this big, it's a couple years. For an animal to get this big, it's a decade. So, but the ultimate goal is to, to get enough of the babies to a, to a size where they can be they can escape from that from the vulnerability of, from octopus and reproduce on their own. So and it, and and whether or not and I've had people ask, um, should we just raise them to big adult size in the lab before we stick them out there? And that unfortunately comes with a lot of other complications, usually uh, surrounding money and um, just effort. If it takes 10 years to get one abalone this big. That's a lot of time and a lot of effort. So it's that balance of maximizing. And we're, 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 we're testing that too. We're testing what's the best size to put them out in that maximizes their survival. The question is more about their brain and what in their brain allows them to, um, allows them to puzzle solve and to problem solve and, and to be as you know, smart or intelligent as they are. Um, now, I, I can't speak too much about the, the, the neuro aspect of the brain. They do have a, rel a very advanced, um, nervous system. Um, what I can speak on is what kind of, what we think led the evolution of their ability of, of why they're so smart. So if we go back millions of years ago, 30, 300 million years ago, we see the, the, the evolution of cephalopods. So cephalopods are this larger group that encompasses at least what still exists today, the octopus, the cuttlefish, the squid, and the nautilus. I think three of those four groups are present here in the aquarium. There's the, there are cuttlefish, there are nautilus, there are octopus. Excellent. Um, so all you're missing is squid. You need to complete the package. Um, but we used to have, there used to be a, a lot more cephalopods um, and a lot of them went extinct in one of the great mass extinctions um, in, our, in, our, in our past history. Their cephalopods used to be the dominant invertebrate in the ocean. If there is one time period that I could go back to, it would be to see what the oceans looked like when there were ammonites, which looked a lot like, cuddle, or like Nautilus, ammonites the size of a Volkswagen. Um, the diversity was amazing, and most of them were shelled. And so as you move through time and you get the evolution of, of bony fishes, you get this weird competition thing. And a lot of really neat evolutionary things are driven by competition between two species or two groups of animals. And so we think that the evolution of their, of their brain and of the nervous system started with this competition with the bony fishes. Like I gotta be one step ahead of the fish and then the fish get one step ahead of the octopus and then the octopus and, the, and you go back and forth through evolutionary time. Um, and then branching off of that, one of the reasons why we think octopus are in general smarter than the squid or the cuttlefish or, um, or the nautilus. You know, I say smarter, they're, they're, they can, they can you know, puzzle solve, they can manipulate their environment a lot better. And we think that is the key, is the ability to manipulate. And if you look at other, other animals throughout the animal kingdom, ones that we think of traditionally smart, us, other primates, um, crows, octopus, we all have this pretty amazing ability to manipulate the environment around us. And there's definitely some evidence of octopus uh, tool use. And they have used shells as shelter. And they have um, been able, so, we, we've, so they, we've identified them as tool users, which we think represents a, a higher level cognitive ability, a higher level intelligence. And again, we think that's connected to, to their ability to manipulate the environment around them. So the question is, all this stuff that gets pl th uh, placed in the water, um, either accidentally or on purpose, run off from different you know, companies and wastewater and rainwater um, that, that goes through the cities and drags a lot of stuff with it. How is that affecting the abalone and, and octopus and just kind of our, our overall kelp forest ecosystems? Um, 
It's another excellent question that we don't fully understand yet. There's been a lot of work on coral reefs, and our, our understanding is that, at least in coral reefs, we know sunscreen really seems to have a negative impact on coral reefs. And for those of you who have been recently to a reef somewhere, they may have told you, you know, don't put on as much, only put on sunscreen on your face and your hands, and then wear a rash guard or something else to protect yourself from the sun. Try to decrease the amount of sunscreen you're putting in the water. Um, and in California, oh man, that's a complicated question. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of people working on it, uh, a lot of waste, uh, wastewater engineers that are trying to manage the waste that's going in to, I was actually just speaking with one of my engineer friends last night about the work that they're doing to try to manage the waste and the trash that's going from uh, different watersheds and into the ocean. Um, we don't, we, we know that some, some runoff, some, so if there's a lot of nutrients that enter the environment, that's when we get these big these big blooms of toxic algae. Red, a lot of you may have heard of red tides, and it actually shut down the Dungeness crab fishery, the, the, the prevalence of demoic acid, um, which, is a, which is a product of these big algae blooms that's very toxic to humans and to sea lions. We see sea lions that eat too much fish that's, in, that's infested, or not infested, but um, infected by this, not, it's not the right word there, but it has the demoic acid in their tissues. We see, strange neurological effects. Sea lions have seizures. Um, they still birth their babies. It's very serious consequences. And that, that prevalence of demoic acid is a direct result from, from runoff and too much stuff going into the water that's contributing to those blooms. So that's a very complicated question. There's a lot going on to understand that because it's an incredibly important one, especially since we have so many people living on the coast. Um, and understanding how our presence here is going to impact our direct environment is a very, very important one. So the question is, can we keep out the octopus? <laughs> we have had long discussions about this. Um, generally, the answer is no. Um, there's pretty much nothing that can be designed that an octopus can't get into. Uh, the, this, is a, this is also a problem worldwide. And one thing I didn't talk about too much is understanding octopus movement and, and you know, why they're going where they go is applicable to ecosystems globally. Anywhere where there's some kind of trap-based crustacean fishery, so lobsters, crabs, they have a problem of octopus getting into the lobster tra trap, eating the lobster, they leave just the empty shell, and then the octopus pieces out, and the poor fishermen pull up the basket, and there's the, uh, just an empty dead lobster in there, which they're not very happy. I wouldn't be very happy about that either. So um, this is happening in Florida and South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Alaska, anywhere. It's, it's, a, it's a problem everywhere. There's been a lot. I know there's a group in Tasmania specifically that's been trying to design a lobster trap that will still catch the lobster but not let the octopus in. And I think they've now determined that's impossible. Um, with the abalone specifically, what we are actually going to try to do is, yeah, kind of put the, the abalone in like an, like an isolation box, have some, have some nice mesh so that there's still good water flow, um, but have them essentially all sealed off to give them you know, a time to acclimate. And it's kind of stressful to go from your, your nice, you know, warm or nice, or your nice, comfortable lab environment where you get fed on a regular basis and there's nothing around to eat you, to this big, scary world where there's things with eight arms and suckers trying to get at you. So we're trying to ease that transition, probably just like you know some of your kids were when they went off to college. Um, and we want, but the problem with that is if they're stuck inside this little box, now okay, well they can't feed. So it adds the work of, to us as researchers where we got to go down, open up the box, and throw some algae in there on a regular basis so they don't all starve to death. So it, again, it comes down to that balance of effort and time and money and what's actually going to be the most beneficial. But we're still testing that option for sure. I am hesitant that it will work, but I am willing to give it the old science try. So the question is, is there fear that the frequency and the sound that those tags emit um, is interacting with the octopus or affecting them in any way? And that is, that's an excellent question. It's one that we don't really know yet. Um, octopuses don't really hear. They don't have, they, they can sense water vibrations. They don't really hear sound. Um, so in that regard, we don't think it does. This, this has only been done one or, or two or three times before ever to tag an octopus in this way. So this is very new, kind of cutting edge um, application of this technology. 
It's been used with fish and sharks a lot. Uh, the problem with tagging an octopus is that it goes back to that ability to manipulate their environment thing. If they don't want the tag in them, they can reach inside themselves and pull it out. <laughs> so it's frustrating and challenging for researchers <laughs> to get around that little snafu. So you kind of just got to put it in a place where they could get to it if they really wanted to, but you got to hope that they, it's just, they just eventually ignore it. Um, my tag retention rate is at about 70 to 80 percent, so it's, I'll, I'll take it, I'll take it. Um, but so we, we don't really quite, we're still learning about how this technology is going to influence the octopus. There has been one um, incident that I know of where, so kelp bass and other fish in kelp forests are tagged a lot, it's a very common technique for that. Um, there were some harbor seals that seemed like they were picking up, they could hear the sound that the tag on the fish were, was emitting and they were using that to track and eat the fish. So harbor seals also eat octopus. I know they're out in La Jolla. This is something that I'm concerned about. Um, but we're going for it. <laughs> uh, nothing worth, what's it saying? Nothing hard worth do. I don't know. It's going to be hard, but I don't shy away from a challenge. So I hope to learn a lot. And yeah, maybe I'll talk to you in a year. So the question is, how do big abalone resist the uh, predation by the octopus? Um, and they, they definitely don't run away. Um, they couldn't. Uh, but the, for the, it comes down to more with the effort that the octopus is willing to put forward. So if an octopus really, really, really wanted to eat a 10-inch abalone, it definitely could. But that's a lot of effort. On, on you know a lot of time that that octopus is going to put into into drilling. So an, an abalone that big, there's no way an octopus could pull it off the rock. So it would have to use that radula, that rasping tongue, to essentially lick a hole through the shell. And the shell of an abalone that big is you know probably half an inch thick. So we're talking hours. So when that animal could be looking, finding something else that maybe isn't you know as calorically intensive, but takes way less time to get to. Um, so animals are constantly balancing risk and reward in their head. So to stay, for, an, for an octopus, which is soft and squishy, and lots of things like to eat octopus because remember there's only that one hard part, the rest is all just solid protein. So anything that can eat an octopus will. So for them to be out on top of an abalone totally exposed is pretty risky for them. And the benefit of getting that abalone in a few hours whenever it licks through the shell is probably it probably doesn't outweigh the risk of them being so exposed.